So without further ado, let me introduce to you Mark Woods. Mark is going to be talking about using robotics to explore harsh spaces. Um, Mark has somewhat of a, an impressive pedigree, so let me see if I can list this correctly. So Mark leads the autonomy and robo robotics group at CISIS. He has over 20 years' experience as an innovator leading researching, leading, sorry, I forgot the comma there in my notes, leading, researching and developing, and commercialising robotics, autonomy, computer vision, and machine learning-based applications. Um, he also I mean, just happens to have a PhD in artificial neural networks as well. Um, I've said this a number of times. I've been really enjoying reading the uh, questions that we asked our speakers to fill in. And one of the questions was, what's your main motivation? And uh, Mark's reply was, I like solving first-of-kind problems. You are in the right job, my friend. <laughs> uh, I don't know if it's just me, but exploring Mars kind of seems first-kind problem. So awesome. Um, so more <laughs> a little more seriously, uh, Mark's talk intends to explain how they built these robot services and lessons they learned along the way. So let's give Mark a warm BrizTech welcome. Thank you. Hey, everybody. So this talk is about the technology we developed uh, which allows robots to autonomously explore so-called harsh or extreme environments. When I say autonomously here, that means being able to ca carry out complex tasks in the presence of a reasonable amount of uncertainty about the environment we're in uh, with minimum or sometimes no human intervention. And when I talk about harsh or extreme environments, these are environments that are complex, dangerous, in some cases, it's impossible, as you'll see a bit later, for obvious reasons, to send humans there, at least currently. Um, so therefore, but it's important that we inspect, survey, or, or measure them in some kind of a way. So, and sometimes the only means we have available to do that is a robotic means. So we have to think about autonomous robotic solutions for that. I'd like to talk about sort of three aspects of the work of MA today, just to introduce you to it. And the first I want to talk about is our anchor, well, what I would call our anchor examples. This is autonomy on Mars. As you can probably appreciate, Mars is a pretty unique example and it tends to shape the technology that we have to sort of develop to, to sort of solve the problem. So I'll walk you through the challenges, the sort of motivation for that and the kind of things that we've developed, at least at a high level. It'll, it'll be a bit of a, a whistle-stop tour. We've been successful in taking some of that technology in recent years and then reshaping it or repurposing it for other applications. So what I want to do then is sort of take you to a very different place, a different application. This is quite significant in that it's not like Mars at all. These are tunnels underground and we still need to do the autonomous survey thing, but obviously there's a different set of requirements that apply. But at, at the heart, there's a lot of things that overlap. So I just want to talk a little about, about that application, which will give you another flavor of, of autonomy in this kind of application area. And the third thing I want to talk about is, it's just I want to focus on that idea of reshaping technology for other applications, particularly if at the outset it seems like it's a pretty niche thing that you've solved. It's almost in a way, a sort of a selfish thing. It's the kind of talk I would like to have given myself maybe 15 years ago. Because what I didn't realize at the time is when we were focusing on, you know, it's trying to solve the, the autonomy for Mars, a very niche, complex problem, is that time and time again, even within the space domain and then subsequently commercially, we're going to have to re, you know, reshape and be very, very flexible about how we sort of, you know, reuse that technology. And that's actually a hard thing to do well. And I suspect some of you, maybe without even knowing it, are in that position right now where you're focused on one particular problem and the tech you build. If you're in it for the long term, will have to be reused, but again, it's not easy. So I'll, I'll share some of the, the lessons learned along the way. All right, let's go to Mars. And I guess at some level, this question, you might say, is, there's a pretty obvious answer to that, but like everything, the devil is in the detail. There's a bit of nuance here that I think is, is worth just looking into. And I just want to explore that just for a few moments, if I, if I may. To understand the answer to that question, you really have to think about how we do exploration here on Earth historically, and even just the task itself as it's done today. So this is me in the, in the desert in, in South America, in the Atacama. I've got a GoPro which attached to my chest. And the guys you see in the pictures here, or in the video here, are, are geologists. This is a field trial, effectively. And if you notice what they're doing, it's a lot of movement, a lot of acquisition, a lot of modeling in their heads and a lot of analysis. Obviously, there's quite a bit of collaboration going on as well in terms of sharing you know, a sense of what they think this thing is. But ultimately, what they're doing is they start out quite remotely and they work through to a proximal location. They look for targets of interest. But for convenience, I've called this MAMA, these sort of, as, as an acronym, these, these tasks. So it's moving, acquiring, modeling, and assessing. So that's the basic sort of idea. That's what they do. If you think about how we've done this historically here, you know, on Earth, in fact, Bristol's a good place to talk about exploration, obviously, with some of the history in the city. Um, the recipe for this was quite simple. It was 
ships, sailors, and scientists. Now, the scientists were the guys who did the MAMA tasks, primarily. The job of the ships and the sailors was to get them on the ground so they could do these things, right? So that was, that was the sort of gist of it. Now, as we moved away from home, then that, that recipe has changed a little as we went to the moon, for example. Now, I've been fortunate enough over the years to meet some of the, some of the Apollo astronauts. And uh, this is, by the way, this next thing is just a gratuitous use to, of the uh, watershed facilities because I've sat in that cinema so many times. So <laughs> I think it's nice we can show a trailer here of a very amazing film. If you haven't had a chance to see it, this is Apollo 11, the documentary. And what it captures really well from you know, my own personal meetings with them and what, and what we see in the film is that you really needed sailors who could sort of move around these uncharted territories to sort of to get into that problem, if you like, to go to the moon and come back in one piece. And of course, if you know anything about the history of the, the Apollo program, you know that of the six, of the six, sorry, the 12 people who've landed on the moon or walked on the moon, uh, only one of those was actually a geologist, and that was Jack Schmidt on Apollo 17, right at the very end before they terminated the program. Um, so what actually had to happen then is that those MAMA tasks I spoke about were primarily done by, the, by the, the sailors, the astronauts. So they had to train the astronauts in the Nevada desert and so on to basically do these tasks and, and sort of do them on behalf of the geologists back on Earth. Now, as we move a little bit further from home, then that recipe changes once again. This time, now I could have shown a trailer of The Martian, which is another fun film, but it's still, it's still that's overdoing it a bit. That's still fiction. Uh, for the moment, um, the only thing we can send now is the ship. Right? We can't send the scientists, we can't send the sailors, so the only thing we've got is the ship. And that means that those tasks that I mentioned earlier, well, guess who's got to do them now, at least in some shape or form, it's got to be the robot that's got to do those. So now we're into a control program, a problem. So the question is, how do we get this thing to do those tasks remotely? Now usually for a robotics sort of situation, you've got two options. You've got a tether, clearly that's not going to work in this case, or you could consider uh, remote uh, or F. Now, okay, this is the first question of the day. I know it's late. Does anybody want to guess at the distance between Earth and Mars? Any, any, I know you might know. You can be quiet. But <laughs> any, any, anybody else? Any, any, any guesses? There's one. Eight, I like that. It's pretty close, actually. So an average is about 225. It goes between 56 and about 401 million kilometers. If you divide the speed of light into that, you get something like this, which is approximately what we would call the round-trip light time. So that's the time to get there and back can be anything up to 45 minutes. So imagine you're trying to control a 4x4 four four in a desert you've not really seen before, you haven't got <coughs> maps, and you hit forward on the joystick, and you've got to wait 45 minutes, well, 22 and a half minutes before you get an answer back. The catch is that's not normally how we operate. We actually quite often go via satellites, and the real catch is that we get very little data back, so we don't get a lot of imagery back. That bit's quite constrained. The bandwidth is pretty limited, and there's a lot more latency involved in it as well. So that's a big constraint we have. So what does that mean in practice? Well, obviously forget joysticking. And the, the key of this is really we control these things by sending small parcels of information. So again, a good analogy might be if you think about armies in the past where you know, they had couriers trying to ship high level commands, and then the, the, the armies, if you like, had to expand those commands and, and tactically deal with them in the local situation. That's kind of the situation we're in as well. Um, so what you need is basically some degree of self-reliance or autonomy to sort of carry out the tasks and so on, or at least advanced automation. All right, so about 20 years ago, the European Space Agency said, look, we want to send a robot to the moon, a mobile vehicle. They'd never done this before. I got sort of involved because of my PhD background and so on. So we had a whole host of problems to look at and that we sort of helped them out with some. There's obviously a number of people involved in this, but our own company got involved in some aspects of the, the autonomy problem, or quite a few of them, actually. And the mission is trying to answer this question, is there life on Mars? What that really means is looking for particular types of carbon uh, that might indicate that there was life on Mars or that there might still be life on Mars in some way. And really, our job, is, our job back then at least was to work out if we could do some of these tasks in an autonomous way on the vehicle. So I would say already, if you know anything about robotics, this is a hard thing to do, right? Um, there's, these, these things in themselves are actually quite hard to do. But there's an additional set of constraints, and this is the detail of where, where Mars gets interesting from an engineering point of view, is that we are limited in many ways. So we're limited in terms of mass. It's hard to get mass onto the surface of the planet. A big one is power, and I'll come on to that a little bit later, and also computation and memory. Again, that constrains us quite a bit. It's also a relatively unknown environment, so we have effectively the equivalent of, what, 30 centimeter per pixel maps, so that's not unlike what you get in Google Earth. But again, for practical purposes, if you're trying to navigate a vehicle that's smaller than a mini, um, things that can trip it up, you're not going to see it from orbit. So planning at a tactical local level is not possible with the kind of resolution we have. 
It's also what people would call a GPS tonight. In other words, there's no external infrastructure that tells you where the vehicle is. So we have to estimate that mathematically using orbital data and also doing some tricks on the robot itself. And as I mentioned, communications is also limited. And stating the obvious, but we only get one go at this rate. Um, and what's interesting about this is, yes, we, if you're, sometimes people say, can you patch software? Yes, we can. But as you can probably appreciate, it's not something you want to do you know, a lot of because the whole testing regime is pretty stringent and it's not an easy thing to do quickly uh, because anything you do there may affect the mission and obviously there's a lot riding on that mission. So it's not something you want to do um, too often. Okay, you might be wondering what kind of technology we're looking at and it's, I suppose it's pretty obvious. If you look at the Venn diagram of things or like of the overlap of you know, computer vision, robotics, AI, different flavors, we pretty much have to look at every one of those apart from NLP. We're not looking at trying to c communicate with Martians yet. <laughs> Might happen later, but I haven't had that request just yet. But I suppose what's interesting, AI, obviously, you know, different interpreters, but, but we do do symbolic AI. That's actually an important, important part of what we do. We have to look at doing what we call mission planning, and that's in addition to things like machine learning and, and computer vision. And I suppose an additional constraint is worth mentioning that, you know, as a group, there's only two groups in the world, at least for some of the narrow things we've done, have, has done these, and that's obviously NASA, JPL, and ourselves. So obviously, NASA have done a hell of a lot more, and we're only just getting into this ourselves. But what that means, again, is it's a very small user community, and are sort of, we were starting pretty much from scratch in many ways, and that's added another layer of complexity. So it, it requires quite a degree of self-reliance, and we're back to the first of the kind thing again. Okay, let's dig into some of the technology you need to sort of implement those tasks. The first thing you need is an autonomy architecture. If you're familiar at all with robotics, you'll know that this is not unlike, it's effectively a hybrid three-level architecture. So what this means is the bit at the top allows the guys on the ground to bundle up those high-level postcards of, of commands that I mentioned. They can send it to the vehicle and then they can be expanded and they can be distributed to sort of agents of expertise, um, particular uh, specialists, if you like, that are, that are automated or autonomous on board. So think of, for example, a submarine where you have a commander and an ops manager who will then sort of distribute these, or the XO who will distribute them to specialists like navigation and so on. And that's what sits within this. I'll touch upon this at the end of the talk, but what's critical in this architecture is the level of abstraction. In other words, how we move information between these, these blocks, these, these islands of, of, of autonomy. Uh, because if you get that wrong, the whole thing falls apart. Uh, we have multiple versions of this that typically we, at R&D level, at sort of lower TRL levels, this would be a C++ implementation because ultimately we're moving to flight C, so we try and maintain some link with that. Um, but there are various versions we use in the different phases of the development. Let's look at some of the autonomy capabilities that are sit inside that architecture, these, these specialisms. And I'll just focus on three. There's quite a number of other ones, but I'll just focus on these three for now. Um, the first of these is what we call autonomous navigation. Some people call it GPS denied autonomous navigation. But this is basically self-driving, but on Mars. Um, so we're doing three things. We're localizing, that's working out where we are in six degree of freedom position. So that's X, Y, Z, roll, pitch, yaw. Uh, we're also mapping where we, the, the space around us in, in usually two and a half D. So we know where we are and we know what's around us. And the other thing we do then is you know, usually what happens is we command the robot to go, you know, follow a particular line. It's in a position to see all the, the nitty gritty right around it, so it'll have to deviate. It has the authority to move around that and path plan. Uh, what's significant here, again, this is the space sort of peculiarity of this, is because of the mass and power limitations, we can't, we can't use LiDAR that you might, for example, see in self-driving solutions. We can only rely on stereo vision. So a bit like you guys are walking right now, you're doing feature matching without realizing it, that's what we use to sort of create the uh, three, well, to derive a 3D representation and then work out position and maps from that. Another thing we do is what we call 3D modeling. So this is what might be called a digital twin. What that means in practice, and this is where it gets challenging, is we have to try and find a way of knowing where the robot was, where the sensors on that robot were, you know, were at the time of acquisition. So we can build this, this fused model. You're looking here at high resolution images. You're looking at local D DTM, digital terrain models the robot has built, hazard maps. You can see the GPR, which is a sort of uh, look underground where we're looking to, for sites to drill. All of that has been fused into one, what we call a metric model, so you can measure all of that. And that's quite important because traditionally, um, the guys who run these instruments tend to run in one channel. And, I, and sometimes I've been involved in a few trials where we've had effectively scientists in the UK, we've had our robots in the desert in South America, and we've run blind trials. So as far as they're concerned, they're on Mars. And it's interesting to watch some of the operational problems we have there, the, if you like, the human DevOps. And 
and it's, it, one of the big problems is communication. So here you're looking at some very, very happy GPR instrument people because this is the first time they saw their instrument linked with the other channels, right? So they can actually then communicate on a common basis. Now it sounds like a very simple thing. In practice, that's really hard to do on Mars because of the lack of you know, extra localization we've got. So we have to work quite hard on that. And the third thing I'll dig into in a little bit more detail is for any of you data scientists and sort of machine learning types in the audience, this is what we call autonomous science. Um, this is really looking for things of interest in the scene. We do it in two places. One is on the robot itself, and the other is off-board looking at data that comes from orbiters on Mars. Uh, I'll look at the first one, uh, the onboard bit first. And right, back to these constraints I mentioned. So the, no the amount of power that we have available for the robot to do everything is, I don't know if you want to guess, but the clues in the light bulb, obviously, it's around 200 watts. So that's to drive, to drill, to stay warm, to do communications, to do thinking, to do navigation, all of that stuff. So you can imagine that for any kind of intelligent scene assessment, you get very, very little of the pie chart of energy that's available on a given day. And the other constraint we have is that the computation is quite limited. Any, anybody old enough to remember Pentiums? Any, any, any takers? There's probably one or two. Well, we're, we're kind of on that order. And the reason for that is the processors we have are rad hard. So there are many, many, many sort of generations behind what's available terrestrially at the moment because of the radiation, uh, the lack of a radiation screen on Mars. So that's the constraints. Another problem, without getting into too much detail on this, but from a theoretical point of view in terms of detecting things of interest, it's, well, it's interesting. A lot of the important science discoveries have been, guess what, serendipitous. They've been opportunistic. So it's, it's, it's the unknown things we're after. So it's not a case of we can train on something and say classify these things we expect to see. Usually the stuff they really don't want to know is the stuff they weren't expecting, right? So that adds a bit of a twist. So a nice, actually, example, a link between the current robots, the NASA robots that are there at the moment, and the Apollo program is this is rover wheels that have kicked up some dust, and they've discovered this stuff, which is really interesting in terms of evidence of water and so on. Jack Smith, the geologist I mentioned on Apollo 17, did the exact same when he kicked over some regolith and discovered some strange looking orange soil on the moon. Again, you know, serendipitous stuff. So that affects the, the kind of the, the architectures for the, the novelty or the systems we develop. Despite that, we've been successful enough and able to um, put some of this stuff in orbit. In fact, we did that back in the mid 2000s. I think I put the first, at least civilian neural network of a sort in, 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 in space that may be different from a defense point of view. But crucially, we were also able to show on a robot, this is a test trial in the desert, where the robot was basically picking up things that our human operators missed. Now, this was important from a, let's say, a credibility point of view, saying, look, guys, you've done this blind trial. You thought you knew all this sort of stuff. But you know, because of the constraints that apply in, in remote operations, you missed an important science target. And we have evidence of this as well from the actual real operations. So this helps build credibility for, for including the technology. All right, we can't ignore this. This is, you know. It's current and so on, and, and it's not to say we're not looking at it. In fact, we are looking at it in a number of ways. Um, of course, you might say one of the issues with, 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 with the learning of this kind is, well, where do you get your data? All right, uh, given that we've only got you know, three robots that have been to Mars effectively, uh, and there's not a huge amount of data. But we have labeled the data that exists. We, you know, my own group effectively labeled uh, all of the sort of meaningful data we could get from the existing NASA missions, some of the NAVCAM images and so on. Uh, we did that as a, as a crowdsource project initially and then did it again. If you want to uh, sort of get to catch me afterwards, I can tell you about the pros and cons of doing that as a crowdsource thing. I think somebody mentioned in an earlier talk about don't pay people for motivation, right? That's, that's definitely true. We found that. It's really about their interest in the tech is, is the thing of interest or that, that matters. Um, so we created a large data set. That has allowed us to explore different models. Um, there's a bit of a limit to what I can say about this at the minute. We are evaluating these models and the results are not completely out there, so I'm a little bit constrained um, from a client point of view in terms of what I can say. We can certainly show that the models are improving the performance of the, of the vanilla you know, computer vision and sort of SVM type approaches that we've used up to date, but there's still some issues with it as well. Um, but it's, it's sort of work in progress. What I can do is talk about a little bit more about the offboard case. This is where we're taking data from the orbiters that fly around Mars, and what we can do with that, where we have a little bit more computational grunt, if I can put it that way. So this is an interesting problem. When they go to Mars, they have to pick a landing site, and a very, very narrow number of geologists, specialists, will look at these very high-resolution images. These are, from, these are called high-rise images, and they can be extremely large in the sense that they may be 8 by 30 kilometers, right? Now, it's not possible in the time available and with the number of experts to fully label those things because they're trying to understand the geology. By understanding the geology, they can work out where best to place the robot and find interesting science. But they just don't have the bandwidth to do it. 
So we were asked to see if we could throw some you know, new attack at that and see if we could automate this process in some way. And I'm pleased to say that that worked out pretty well. We were able to effectively imply, apply the ontology that the, that the scientists use and at a pixel level, in other words, doing semantic segmentation, we were able to, with a very high degree of accuracy, label every single pixel in those images to the point that even though this was only a prototype, they actually sucked it into the mission. It was actually used to support the landing site selection in the end, which nobody really expected. And it's now being looked at for use in, in the moon and also for Venus. Um, because it was, you know, what, what's happening here is in 15 minutes we can classify one of those huge images which is just not even possible from a human point of view. So this is a bit of a game changer. It does show you the benefit of the technology when it's used in that way. Okay, let's, I've sort of run through, you know, some of the constraints we have. I've looked at some of the technologies at a very high and a quick level. And the, there's another question here is how do you know what's going to work on Mars? Because ultimately somebody's signing a check for let's just say well over a billion, and you're saying, I want to do some autonomy on your mission. And he's going, well, how do you know it's going to work? <laughs> because if it goes wrong, it could go very wrong, right? Because it's taken over the spacecraft to some, to some level. Obviously, we can't go there, so that constrains us. So the way we try to solve this problem is by going to places on Earth that are a little like uh, Mars, so deserts. So hence, we go to the Atacama a lot. We pioneered some trials out in the Atacama for the European Space Agency. It's also been to North Africa. Uh, where else? The Tenerife Caldera. So we've been to lots of different places. Uh, and the reason we go there is to sort of, from a visual point of view, for a lot of the tech we have, it's reasonably representative enough that we can, we can carry out meaningful tests. And what we come away from with those sort of uh, field trials is a huge amount of data, but also a lot of metrics uh, and results and th that help build confidence uh, in the technology and show the stakeholders that this stuff is actually you know, fit for purpose. Um, we've done things like this where we've, you know, my own group has got the, the longest sort of record of whatever for a fully autonomous drive. We've held that since 2012. Again, the, the, the real value of this is in convincing stakeholders that this stuff will work because one of the concerns with vision-based techniques, which are primarily feature-based, is in a very featureless environment. That may not work so well. And that was a huge concern before we started to look at this tech. But trials like this showed that actually it was really robust. In fact, I've been in situations where I've watched people leave our base camp to go find the robot and go into dips and get extremely lost, and the robot knows exactly where it is. In fact, one of the stakeholders got lost, so that was actually a, a real win. He said, the, robots must, the robot knows where it is, but you don't, so they're, okay, fine. Um, you've sold it. Um, another thing we can do is we fly UAVs out there, and the re there's two reasons for this. One is to essentially um, to simulate the kind of images we would get from orbit from, from the Mars orbiters that are used then to plan where the space should should go. Um, we have to downgrade what we get from the UAVs to allow us to do that. But there's another reason we do this, because we can use the high resolution images and photogrammetry to build up effectively a very high resolution to DEM. And if we have that DEM, that digital elevation model, we can take that and suck it into our simulators. And then that allows us to effectively start to create um, synthetic images of what we've seen in the desert. So in other words, we're not bound by just the data we have from the desert. We can then take it back, simulate, and go off piste to a level that allows us to simulate all sorts of other different conditions. So it, again, you know, we're maximizing what we get out of that experience. All right, where has all this ended up in the Mars case? So from our point of view as a company, we now have two major software components on the mission from before all that tier, after all that um, R&D. One is called Mission Management System. So this is looking after the payload on ExoMars rover. Uh, in other words, if there's any science of interest and discoveries detected, that's, that those initial measurements will come through our management software and the first discoveries you'd like, if they happen, will we'll come through that. And the second is visual localization. So this is working out where you are. That's that first of the three things I mentioned in the autonomous navigation piece. And all of this is, as you can imagine, is a collaboration with an awful lot of uh, universities and smaller companies like UCL, Oxford, and, and, and others as well. From our point of view, there's two interesting things here. First, it's very exciting because we've gone from, well, you know, we've gone from zero blank sheet of paper all the way through to the end of the TRL chain. All being well, but there are some system tests that are still, still sort of ongoing, but all being well, we're due to launch in July of next year. Um, and then that would mean we would be landing, I think it's March 19th, uh, 19th of March 20, uh, 2021 for operations then. Um, and the other thing about this, this, this business of going from blank sheet all the way through to the end of the TRL chain, there's a couple of implications from that. The first is to do that, um, this bit was critical, and I'll touch upon this again in the, in the last section. Being able to be very flexible with that architecture I mentioned and the whole, the whole technological approach was important. You're looking at some of the platforms that we put our autonomy stack on. Now, we integrated a very low level, in other words, speed and driving control, right? If that's on the platform at a low level, everything north of that, that's what we take care of, all the autonomy. 
Um, these are just some of the platforms. So in terms of platform variability and the number of configurations we had to use this stuff in, this was, was really important. So the other implication of this is, though, if you think about it in the abstract, if you've got environments that have these characteristics, and you know, I would say this one on the right in particular, if they're remote, they're hard to reach from a digital point of view, and these other things apply, what we've also got is an outcome from all this work. You know, just sort of step away from Mars for a second is essentially the core elements of that an autonomous survey and inspection system for exploration. And it could be repurposed. And there's a, initially we thought, well, could we? And we'll talk about an example of that right now. So we've done this a few times, but what I want to do is step away from the Mars, the dry stuff, and go to something very, very different. And I'm going to ask another question. I know, again, it's still late. But if I say the word network, what comes to mind? Straight off the top of your head. Anybody want to shout out? Internet, Internet right? Anybody else? Euro. Euro. OK, right. Which is fair enough. A bunch of engineers in a room, that's what we're going to say. But there's actually another network that I think we tend to ignore. How many people have used one of these today? I'm hoping there's a few yeses. There we go. <laughs> it gets really interesting when I say, how many people have used, <laughs> used one of these? And somebody doesn't, then it gets really interesting. Um, as you can probably appreciate, there's a whole other network on the ground that we're pretty dependent on. Right? Um, we tend not to think about it too much, but it brings water to us and takes all sorts of you know, wastewater away and so on. There's a lot of it. If we go back to the moon again, that's the distance. And that's how much in terms of the UK uh, you know, potable water network there is that you don't see too often unless it fails. And in terms of wastewater, it's a bit more than that. So there's a lot of this stuff that we're dependent on. Um, it's extremely important that we understand the condition of this network. Our civil security depends on it. Um, and even in simple levels, if you ever got caught in traffic in a big city because of an outage and you see a water leak, well, you'll, you, you've been through there, I'm sure many have experienced that. But also other things can happen that are not great, you know, so, you know, these, these are gaseous environments. They're, they're classified as ATEX-1 environments and some ATEX-2. I've seen a bit, this is basically a methane buildup and a, and a, and a sewer build exploding in, in China. I've seen the version of that happen in New York as well, right in central New York. So. It's not really what you, where you want to be. These are dangerous places. And as I'll mention in a moment, we have to send people into these spaces currently. And also bringing it closer to home, you know, the, there's, there's regulations that apply to water quality. This is a report from, I think it was the EU, in terms of water quality in the UK, in terms of the rivers. And in terms of being good, the UK river, currently the UK river system, I think, was only 15% of the rivers in the UK actually hit the, the, the mark where it should be, only 15%. So there's a long way to go, I guess, to get to where we need to be. And of course, part of that is, is you know, incidents that may come from the networks. Not the whole story, but it's definitely part of that. So it's really important that we maintain an infrastructure that, as you can appreciate, is quite old. It's Victoria, many, a lot of this stuff as well. So it's you know, potentially suffering from that as well. Now, interestingly, the way that condition is assessed is, hasn't really changed much since the mid-1800s, you know, right? So basically, it's people in hard hats these days in high vis and maybe a, peri a cherry picker, but they go and inspect it manually. We send people into these spaces to do that. Uh, and that's not really ideal in, in, in 2019. It's extremely dangerous. I use this video just to sort of highlight some of that. It's a, a little bit tongue in cheek because there's obviously a lot of regulation applies and it's, but I've been in these spaces and trust me, they're not really where you want to be. They are dangerous. And it is amazing. It is amazing. That's I think fresh concrete. It's amazing what people have to do on our behalf to keep this stuff running. Uh, and this next one sort of, Kind of sums up, yeah. <laughs> now, sometimes I'll go on and I'll actually show you, you know, extracts from, uh, it's going a bit too far here, but, you know, the, the reports that come, there are fatalities every year and a lot of injuries because of, the, you know, the danger that people put them in. So just to make that point. It's also slow and complex because obviously to put people in there, we have to heavily regulate it and it is very regulated here. And that means we have a lot of safety infrastructure as well, which is a good thing. But obviously it also then adds to the sort of latencies and so on. Um, and finally, I would argue it's an imperfect assessment because these guys are under a lot of pressure with not a lot of time. You're going into dark environments with head torches and so on, and you're expected to do a, you know, a detailed survey to a short amount of time. It's not ideal. And usually what happens is you get sort of bits and pieces. Obviously, the, the person that goes in in year one may not be the person that goes in the next time around and so on. So it could be maybe improved. One way we could do that is, a, if you like, a sort of dream scenario is to send the robots in. Let them do the sort of dangerous bit and bring back a virtual model of the environment. And then these guys could look at this in safety and apply their expertise offline. That might be a solution to that. All right, but there's some, there's some significant obstacles to this, particularly in these kind of domains. And the reason is really simple. They are very niche, right? They don't necessarily have a huge amount of commercial bandwidth because they're, they typically attract or require bespoke solutions. Um, so you're not talking about mass scale solutions like you would in the consumer world. 
again, expertise is limited. You need a lot of expertise to develop the solutions. There's not a lot of it, and it's deployed elsewhere. And also, these are you know heavily regulated environments. Um, so you know you need to understand that, and that adds another layer of sort of engineering complexity as well. So one way around this, though, is to think about reusing the wheel, and clearly that's something we've done effectively, is take some of the tech we've done elsewhere. And what's nice about this is we work in a very heavily, heavily regulated environment where it's mission critical and so on, so there is a bit of a nice sort of uh, match over there. So let's give you an example of what that looks like. Um, we were asked a little while ago, actually earlier this year, to effectively do a survey of the world's deepest tunnel of its kind. Um, it's an operational tunnel, and we were given one or two days access for this, uh, which is very unusual because it's critical to a particular city. I can't say which one at the moment. Um, and it's very rare to get access at all, but it needed an inspection, and they wanted to send us in and see if we could do this. It was a one-shot, can you do it or not, sort of situation. Um, from a, it's a large tunnel. It's about 7.2 meters in diameter, um, which is significant, given that it's also dark. Um, and in fact, in terms of the environment overlap, there's some overlap with what we have from you know, the Mars case I mentioned earlier in terms of these first things, but also what's different, of course, is unlike dry, uh, unstructured, bright Mars, we're now in a very structured, to an extent, dark and wet environment. So a lot of things change from our point of view, from a robotic point of view. I, it's, it's worth pointing this out. This is, this is quite an ambitious thing to do because you know, there's a reason why self-driving cars haven't made it onto the road yet, because it's hard. Anybody who's doing robotics will know it's not an off-the-shelf you know, off solution at the moment. And on, in this particular situation, we had no access to anything like the actual operational environment. It's a case of apply your expertise, do your best sort of estimate of how we could change the system, thanks, and we'd get in there and do it. I'm pleased to say it was successful. Um, you're looking here at a robot. The thing about autonomy, when it works, is really dull, right? It's not very exciting. This is the robot eye view of, hang on, that's in my way. They didn't tell me about this. It was just to go to go in a line and follow, and follow the tunnel. So in the dark, it's mapping this. It knows where it is. It's working out. It's safe to go around the side of the tunnel um, and, and also basically return on its trajectory and do the job it's supposed to do and then turn around and come back home. Uh, so it's avoiding the thing. I'll not labor too much, given that I'm a bit short on time. Another thing we're doing here is real-time detection of targets of interest and localizing using state-of-the-art deep learning. What's nice and significant about this is that we're using it in a very low-power solution. So the thinking, if you like, that, the, that we're doing here does not affect the overall range of the robot in a significant way. So it allows us to go further between access points. What comes out of this is a report at the end that the robot has generated and said, there you go, that's the survey, that's all the bits I found, which is interesting. And the third thing we bring out is this digital twin. So that's a you know, fully textured, high-resolution model and 3D structure of the actual asset it was in, the full, full scale thing. And what that looks like when you put it in front of a client is, it's, again, it's a bit of a game changer because here you have a client who's able to put 70 members of staff and look at this thing in high detail in a VR environment, it could be desktop. Normally it's one person and a torchlight, so that's different. And here's a guy in the back of a van, the robot's come out, we've taken a stick and we've given him the report, he has access to it straight away. And the difference of course here is the robot's done everything, it's got complete coverage, and that's, that's also another significant thing. We're looking at this as a service now. We're doing this on a bespoke basis, this idea of autonomous robotic survey for a number of different clients as well at the moment. So that's basically that in, 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 a, in a version. Right, I want to just finish up and just talk about this last bit, this, this how do you repurpose and reshape things? And the key word is efficiently, because that's the bit that's, that's not easy to do. So we've obviously taken our stuff from Mars. We put it in these other environments. I've given you an example of one of those. What we're really doing is clients come to us and say, that stuff you've done on Mars, we'd like that for our application too, but you know, we don't necessarily have a huge amount of money. We can't reinvent the wheel, so can we do this efficiently in some way? So they're looking to get as much of our innovation out of that with, you know, in a commercially lean way, if you like. But it's a hard thing to do, because I'm sure, as many of you know, the thing you're doing is you're focusing on the hard problem, right? You're trying to solve, in my case, you know, autonomy on Mars. When you're looking at that, you're not thinking about reuse. Well, I was, and, and, and so on. We had an inkling we might have to, but there's very limited resources applied to that. Ultimately, the, you know, the guy with the money wants the salt. If you can, you know, XKD, XKCD usually have a good line on this. Um, so it's a hard thing to do. But in our case, it's critical to our success as well. So how do we do that? Well, the first thing is to tap into motivation. And there was a talk, I think it was Emily who spoke about this earlier this morning. So what motivates you as engineers? You know, it's great to have been in a conference like this. I've really loved it. Every time you go to one, you pick up a whole bunch of new stuff. But I just want to ask that question, actually. What motivates you as an engineer, a technologist, a creative? Anybody want to shout out some answers? Have you got any ideas? Oh. Solving complex problems. Exactly. So if you survey the engineers and stuff like that, let's say it's, it's solving hard problems, it's uh, learning from other people, it's collaborating, continual learning actually is a big one. Uh, 
I've been fortunate enough in the career I've had to meet an awful, you know, work with a lot of amazing people at NASA and ESA and other places and so on. And it's interesting, the one thing I've observed is that the people who really do some interesting things are those who want to see their, they want to invent the wheel and then see it reused. Everybody wants the wheel gig, right? They, they're in it for the long term, in a way. And, but I would say, if you're thinking about this kind of thing, think about your motivation. Are you, you know, have you got that motivation to do it? I think it's important. The second thing is begin with the end of mind. And what I mean here is, um, when we did this, there wasn't a name for it. And now you've got design thinking and all sorts of different names, which is great. The one I like in particular is Brian Chesky from Airbnb. He calls it 11 star thinking. So in other words, if you're Airbnb and you're trying to design your service, you might think about one star, which is awful, and you might go to typically five star, which is the you know, high level thing. He takes it to the 11 star level. So they go crazy, right? They think about the space shuttle picks you up from home and takes you to Mars and back and whatever. What that does is explode your thinking and you start to think about all the different ways your technology can be used. And then you get into this. Now, apologies, I'm a neural network guy at heart, so this, this means something to me and I might have to explain it. Um, if you think about what a neural network is, it's really an efficient mapping from inputs to outputs. That's all it is, right? Um, and th the efficient mapping bit is where the network has discovered a set of features called the latent vector that really succinctly describe that input to output mapping. So when you present any input, it can say, oh, it's this, we can map it to that. That applies at the architectural level. You remember I mentioned the architecture and I said how it was important that we, we, how we moved information around between the different bits. That's what I was talking about here. You have to very much describe, find a, find a level of abstraction in your architecture that allows that information to exchange that's invariant. In other words, it doesn't care so much if the things around it change. So when we go to Mars, it's bright, all sorts of stuff are happening. We go to tunnels, the perception changes completely, but internally in our architecture, we're not really affected. We've had to, I think, very little, uh, do very little refactoring of our architecture. Right, but time's up. I would just say one last thing. Watch your backgrounds. Another great movie called Heat. In other words, technology will move onto your feet. Right, we heard that in the last talk as well. It's going to come and go, so be ready for that. Right, just to finally say, this still matters. The next problem we're working on is this. It's called Sample, well, we call it Sample Fetch Rover. It's part of the Mars Sample Return problem. Basically, NASA rover will launch next year. It's going to deposit some test tubes that contain samples of interest. In 2027, ESA is going to send a robot up and we've got to try and find these things autonomously. We have some idea where they are, but we actually have to try and locate them several within a day because of the threat of dust storms and all sorts of other stuff. So again, we're having to repurpose this technology, I imagine, so day to day, this still matters to us, this idea of reshaping and repurposing. Right, that's pretty much it. Uh, I just want to say we are a Bristol-based company and to my shame, I think this is the first time we've talked in Bristol in almost 20 years about robotics. So apologies for that, but thanks to Nick and the guys for giving us the opportunity to do that. It's been a great gig. And so please feel free to come and talk to us at some point. And that is it. Thank you for your time. Um, yeah. Thank you so much, Mark. That was brilliant. Great way to end a really great conference as well. We're not quite done yet, though. We do have time for questions. Um, OK, you've heard this spiel from me now. I've said it five times, but I'm going to say it for the sixth time. This is a Q&A session, so we're very keen to have questions. Debates, commentaries, opinions can happen over a pint or a coffee or something later after the event. So right now, we're very keen to have your questions. So do we have any questions about going to Mars or going to tunnels? and all the things involved in that. We do have time, like, we, we'll have the closing remarks in 10 minutes, so we're not in time pressure here. No, I can't get you on the guest list. For <laughs> Mars, that is. <laughs> uh, Lizzie, I think, is on her way. I'd, I'd this, the light was just in my eyes, so I didn't spot that, so nice one, Lizzie. Uh, what sort of things were the highlights of what the rover discovered while it was on Mars? So there are, there are three, well, there's been four, actually, correct? I said three earlier on. There's been four NASA rovers um, on Mars, and Curiosity is still working. The other two main ones, uh, Spirit and Opportunity, have failed. So what they have discovered is effectively indications of the presence of water to an extent. It's still treated as indications, and you know it's very much a very slow process from the from the scientific point of view of just walking through evidence piece by piece to get to that. Um, what's what's been mostly important? Well, th there's a, there's a different view, and the, obviously the geologists would love to get there, right? But it's not happening. Uh, there was a famous quote once by, a, by the PI on the Mare missions that said, you know, uh, you know a, a geologist could do in 30 seconds what a robot takes, you know, uh, almost a day to do. Um, the key thing is, this is why we do, we're doing autonomy, because the, the robots initially were operated in a way that we would operate spacecraft that moved around Earth, which is basically the joystick model. We're moving away from that to allow these things to do more on their behalf. 
and the, the hope is that we will effectively um, increase the likelihood that we'll, we'll make some significant discoveries when we go to Mars to look for signs of life. So the NASA rovers up to this point will be looking for signs of, of water effectively. The European mission uh, that'll go up the ESA rover will be looking for signs of life. And the stuff we've been developing here, the idea is that it'll increase the likelihood that we will find interesting targets. So in a way, we have to wait and see how that goes. Brilliant, thank you very much. Uh, we have another question down here in the middle. Lizzie's on her way. We might need a bit of audience participation to pass the, the microphone down, please. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, brief question. Uh, you've mentioned that th obviously there's no GPS signal on yeah. Mars, but are you guys using uh, signals from orbiters or even like stars to navigate? So we, um, what we use is uh, to do absolute localization of where the robot actually is. So the robot knows where it is in its relative frame of reference. In other words, from, from the day it lands, it starts to build up an estimate, but that estimate will drift. Uh, it's a bit like dead reckoning. It's a bit like in back to exploration again, the boats when they threw logs over and try to work out where they were in the world's exact same problem. Um, so what they do is they use orbital images to try and work out its absolute position. And for the Mare mission and, and, and subsequent for Curiosity, they effectively had teams of PhD guys looking at these images using a technique called bundle adjustment to try and effectively estimate the rover position within a certain tolerance. Um, so that's, that's what they use to try and estimate its position from, a, from an absolute point of view at the moment. That's as, that's, as, that's as good as we can get. Thank you. Okay, more questions. Don't be shy, we're very friendly. Uh, we have a question down here in the middle, thanks. Lizzie's on her way. Uh, I saw that um, NASA are planning eventually to have a drone on Mars yeah. rather than rovers. Could much of your work and models be repurposed uh, for a drone or would it require a lot of rework or re-architecture? Uh, so interestingly, some of the first work I did for the, for the agency was on exactly that problem. It wasn't a drone then, it was an aerobot because Mars, Mars has a thin atmosphere. So it means if you put a balloon up, it'll drift. And the issue there was drifting balloon we're not sure about what the comms profiles of it's not predictable like a robot or a, a you know a ground-based vehicle would be so we had to intelligently manage the energy we, or the the memory we had so as we collected data we worked out which was important to send back so yeah basically have a version of that um that could in fact was initially developed for that and then ended up on the rovers it went that way around almost so yeah brilliant thank you more questions anybody else don't be shy Yes, Nick. Okay, down the front. You, you mentioned Venus as well. So is yeah. you interested in digging into that a little bit? What, what is that actual project? It's just that, again, they're, they're remotely exploring Venus and they have the problem of when they get data from the, the satellites that they send up that look at Venus, essentially, they have got too much data to you know, classify the kind of resolution they want. Because in a way, what the geologists want is that first cut of, you know, as you saw in that image with all the pixels, right? That's, that's the basic classification of that terrain, and then they can start to make more abstract conclusions about what's, what's on that, you know, different parts of the terrain, and then start to think about what they might want to target and so on. So it's really what we did for Mars, but repurposed for Venus. So doing the grunt work for the, for, the, for the experts so that it can classify loads and loads of images, and then they can take that data and go, okay, right, that's the, over, you know, that's the detail level. I can start to then make some conclusions and, and build some models from that. Hang on, Nick, you need the microphone back. Which yeah. is the closest gas planet? Um, so they actually, you're traveling through gas rather than actually doing something on a, on a solid terrestrial surface. You mean from a, in, in from order a, to? From a point of view of uh, exploring uh, the, so the, innards, the innards of a gas. Yeah, so those th obviously those tend to be remote. We had Huygens, I think, way back. Uh, I forget how long ago that was now. Um, the, 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 like a lander, the European lander that dropped in. Um, I think we're away, I mean, the one that we'd love to actually get to is that where a lot of this will even apply at another level is, is Europa, is one of the, you know, the moons and stuff around um, Saturn and something, because it's an icy planet, or an icy moon, sorry, and therefore it'd be great to get in and get down into it, it's seen as pure water, and that would be an amazing thing to do. NASA's sending an orbit of that quite soon, but, you know, it'd be great to get an actual vehicle in there and, and have a look, that'd be something else, but we're a little bit away from that. Awesome, okay, we have time for one more question. Is there anybody else that wants to ask anything? All right, fantastic. Well, there were a good round of questions there. So let's give Mark a final round of applause. Thank you.
And Mark, we can't let you go without giving you oh, no. an Icelandic <laughs> thunderclap. Um, we've all had lots of practice at this by now, so you know the drill. So, three, two, one.